Welcome back. It's time now for Viewpoint, and today we assess the potential prospects of the recently launched Indo-Pacific Economic Framework for South Korea, that is. For more on that, I have Professor Yang Hidong from Iwa Women's University. Professor Yang, welcome back. Thank you for inviting me. I also have Professor Renee Bowen at the University of California, San Diego, live on the line. Professor Bowen, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Thanks for having me. We'll start here in the studio then. Professor Yang, let's start with a bit of information about this new regional economic framework. Well, the IPF stands for the uh, Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. As it says, it's just a frame, global framework that purports the government-to-government uh, -government cooperation in the world. So this is not necessarily about the economic uh, treaty that requires approval by the, the Congress. So there are four major pillars within this initiative. The first one is connect economy and resilient economy and clean economy and the fair economy. Well, each one needs to be elaboration. Uh, the, uh, the connected economy is involved with the economic uh, progress and digital economy. And resilient economy is involved with the recovery of supply chain management. And clean economy is related to uh, clean energy and decarbonization. And fair economy is involved with tax and anti-corruption. But uh, there are some issues to be resolved you know, for success of this initiative. The first one is Taiwan is not included, which is taking a very critical role in the supply chain measure of semiconductors. And number two, even though the I IPEF is talking about the, uh, the clean economy, but there are severe you know, variances in terms of uh, you know, the capacity or the resources to deal with the clean environment among the, the, the members. And number three, the United States is continuously you know, persuaded to join the CP, uh, TPP where the China is, you know, has applied for the uh, uh, restoration in the last September. And number four, there's you know, potential conflict from the Republican you know, the, the, the Congress and who, may oppose, who, who has opposed about this IPEF, the, uh, uh, the initiative. And lastly, and again, this is the government to government the, uh, cooperation. So if their negotiation requires a lot more extensive cooperation that requires the approval agreement at, by the, the Congress, you cannot tell whether IPEF can end up with great success. The American government may have 18 months to come up with the, make any effective you know, resolutions, right, targeting at the November next year at the uh, APEC summit. Let's see what happens in the next 18 months. Right. And Professor Bowen, as Professor Young has mentioned, what more can you tell us about the response to the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework there in the U.S.? So uh, I would say the response is uh, somewhat mixed, uh, but generally positive. Uh, the fact that it's actually uh, being launched means that there's sufficient support for it. Uh, in the United States, uh, certainly, um, you know, the president uh, and his team are very uh, positive on it, but also uh, enough members of Congress on both sides of the aisle are sufficiently uh, uh, positive on it, uh, and that's why it's going through. Right. And Professor Yang, how does this Indo-Pacific trade framework differ perhaps from the regional comprehensive economic partnership and the comprehensive uh, progressive agreement for trans-Pacific partnership. All right. So I already mentioned that the IPEF is quite different from the other kinds of economic-based, market-based international treaties such as you know, RCEP, RCEP, or CPTPP. And those two, the regional the treaties require uh, the, the Congress the approval because those two activities require it is involved with the market opening or a tariff reduction or a tariff in elimination. So why don't we compare about the current scale across all those three, the initiative. The RCEP has about 18 members, including uh, the 10, the Asian countries. Uh, whereas TC, uh, CPTPP has about 11 members with the four Asian countries. And uh, IPEP has about 13 countries with the uh, seven uh, the Asian countries. In terms of uh, the inhabitants, the uh, IPEP is the largest uh, with the uh, GDP scale. But when it comes to the proportion of the export from the Korean government to each region, uh, the RCEP is largest because China is in there in RCEP, whereas Japan, Australia, and New Zealand are you know, already uh, you know, belong to those, all those three uh, international the, the initiative. So Korea is now belongs to uh, RCEP and uh, the IPEF, and uh, we just uh, get approval from the uh, the Congress that we will, you know, start to join the CPTPP in the pretty soon. So yeah, that's uh, 
you know, big difference in terms of the organization and uh, the members of those three international initiatives. Right. But basically, they are different because the RLCAP and CPTP is about the economy, whereas the IPEF is about the building up the global you know, framework and global regulations through the cooperation among the governments. That's it. And Professor Bowen, China, meanwhile, has condemned the Indo-Pacific strategy, claiming that it is doomed to fail. What are your thoughts with regard to this regional strategy? Uh, right. So, uh, you know, depends on the definition of success and failure. Uh, so the uh, IPEF does cover 40 percent of uh, global GDP in the countries it's covering. Uh, and the fact that these 13 countries have signed on and are willing to take on this negotiation, um, I, I would say that's already uh, some measure of success. Um, uh, there is a significant amount of trade, not in terms of goods services, but in terms of digital services that will be covered by IPEF. So uh, unlike uh, the RCEP and CPTPP, uh, indeed, it is not uh, uh, aimed at lowering tariffs, uh, but it is aimed at uh, lowering and keeping low barriers to di digital trade. And that's a significant part of the economy and a growing part of the economy. So there is somewhat of a misperception uh, that uh, IPEF doesn't cover um, uh, expansion of trade in some sense. Uh, it's not goods trade as we're used to thinking about, but it is trade. It's tr trade in digital services. Uh, and that is significant. Right. And Professor Yang, as Professor Bonin said, this regional framework does not uh, offer incentives to its uh, partners by lowering tariffs or by providing greater access to the U.S. markets. Having said that, what does South Korea look to gain through this particular regional framework? Well, the, we should be aware that the American government has consistently emphasized the importance of this region, I mean Asia Pacific. So President Obama has used the term Asia Pacific, but this term has somehow trimmed down to India Pacific since the Donald Trump, you know, even to uh, uh, the Biden. So uh, we may remember about the Biden's emphasis since uh, last year in June. He declared a three a B three W plan, which that stands for the Build Back Better World. That uh, plans to spend about forty trillion dollars to support the build up the infrastructure in the last developed countries to countermeasure against the China's the One Belt and Road, one road uh, started in uh, 2014. And uh, this in February, the, the Biden government also announced the uh, Indo-Pacific strategy of the U.S. And under this plan, they announced the five principles, such as uh, the free and open, and prosperity, connectivity, and security, and resilience. So the IPEF is very one of re representative instrument to realize all these plans. And why you know, this region, I mean, IPF, needs the uh, attention for all of us. The first one is this area, I mean, the Indo-Pacific, has earned about 46% as of 2020 for the global direct investment. And if you, you know, focus on the Asian India, it has attracted about 20% uh, of the, the, the global uh, direct investment. And this area, in other words, is a great, great replacement for China in case there is a severe trade conflict between China and the U.S. And uh, yeah, um, uh, besides, you know, the Singapore and Taiwan and Korea, Japan are there at the hubs for the supply of semiconductors. So there are many, many reasons why the American government has, you know, uh, increased their attention in this region. Right, I see. And moving forward, Professor Bowen, during the launch of the IPEF, Mr. Biden also highlighted the importance of fighting inflation, which in the U.S. is running at a 40-year high. Do you believe the Federal Reserve's aggressive monetary policy stance will perhaps pave a path to recession? So, uh, yes, uh, inflation is certainly at a, a high. It has come down, uh, certainly the May numbers are slightly lower than the April numbers, uh, and uh, the Fed has indicated that they'll continue to uh, raise rates in order to cool down inflation. Uh, this typically has uh, the effect of cooling the economy. So the Fed has a bit of a job to ensure that expectations are set. So uh, uh, investors know, home buyers know uh, that these rates will be going up. Uh, but not significantly. And so they can adjust their buying patent patterns accordingly uh, and hopefully not trigger uh, a very deep recession, but 
uh, what is to be expected is a cooling of the economy. But, but you have to bear in mind that the economy has been growing significantly even with COVID-19. And so as a result, cooling the economy is actually cooling it from quite a, a significant period of growth to begin with. Right, I see. And staying with inflation, Professor uh, Yang, Bank of Korea Governor Lee chang Young will preside over his first policy meeting tomorrow, that is Thursday. What are your prospects? Well, the, uh, tomorrow there will be uh, in the monetary uh, playing board, MPB. It has actually two different kinds of meetings. Uh, the currency policy direction meeting will be held tomorrow. Uh, actually, it's held eight times you know, a year. And the major role of this meeting is to set the base interest rate. And many experts estimate that uh, the base interest rate will increase by 0.25% to 1.75, you know, since tomorrow. And uh, there are a couple of reasons why many experts uh, expect this kind of increase of the base interest rate. The first one is consumer price index has, has increased you know, abruptly in March by 4.8% in March and 4.1% in April. And this is a 13-year-long I mean, this is the first time that uh, the CPI has increased two months in a row in the last uh, 11 years since uh, 2011. And besides 4.8% uh, uh, increase of the CPI is largest in the last 13 years after 2008 in October. So the current government has the, the great concern about the, the inflations because their target inflation rate is 3.1, which is already exceeded by the hitherto inflation rate of 4.1 so far this year. And number two is about the FOMC and the Federal Reserve Bank in the United States. They increased their base rate in early this month to, uh, you know, uh, by made a big step, right, to 0.75 and to 1%. So the margin between the Korean base rate and American base rate is reduced. And because a lot of uh, concerns for the outflow of current, uh, the foreign currencies from the Korean market. So these are the two major reasons why many experts expect that uh, you know, the Emergency Playing Board, MPV, will increase our base rate by 0.25% tomorrow. But some may concern that they may make a big step, which is very unlikely at the moment. And Professor Bowen, aside from then raising interest rates to tackle inflation, what may be some other tangible alternatives? Right, so if you look at the uh, most recent drivers of inflation, it includes food, it includes shelter, housing prices. Uh, so food uh, price increases are uh, uh, clearly being driven by the conflict in um, uh, the Ukraine and Russia. Um, and so uh, to the extent that anything can be done to bolster food supplies globally, uh, as long as that conflict um, uh, persists, uh, then it's going to be um, uh, somewhat of a challenge to tackle inflation. Um, but what else can the uh, government do? We, we have to remember that prices are driven by both supply and demand. So the, to the extent that supply can be uh, increased in certain sectors, uh, in particular housing, uh, I think uh, we'll be able to see some uh, more price relief uh, in those areas. Right, hopefully, of course, then. Professor Yang, in their joint statement following the summit, Presidents Yoon and Biden also agreed on co close consultations to ensure stability in the foreign exchange market. What are the implications of this particular agreement, do you think? Well, the, uh, interestingly, this is the first comment by the both presidents to talk about the foreign exchange market. I mean, the only occasion for the American president to talk about the uh, foreign exchange rate or foreign exchange market is to warn about the artificial manipulation or artificial, you know, the deflation of exchange rate. But uh, in this case, I mean, currently the Korean one is moving in the opposite way because, you know, our, the exchange rate is, is getting very weak unintentionally. And, uh, well, the major meaning of this comments by both presidents is to give the, the strong signal to the market that the 1,301 is very strong psychological safety bell. So even though they did not make any detailed comments on any techniques or any detailed plans, but uh, I mean this signal will give uh, enough, you know, the impressions to the market that uh, in the current one, the depreciation will not go that bad beyond the 1,301. Well, the, uh, many people already start to talk about the currency swap between U.S. dollars and Korean won, which is very unlikely, because American government has made the, this, uh, the currency swap with the Japan, 
EU and many other the currency and the countries. But Korean won is not uh, has improved to that in a key uh, in a critical status. And besides, and our liquidity is not a serious problem at the moment. You know, this is a very temperate situation because the American government is trying to, actually the F, you know, Federal Reserve Bank is trying to increase the interest rate and there's war breakout between the Russia and Ukraine. So these are very temporary reasons why Korean one is getting uh, depreciated against U.S. dollars. So in other words, this is not the right moment for you know, two countries to talk about the, uh, you know, going forward for uh, the dollar and one uh, currency swap. Again, if we are very serious about this one, and this is not the matter between two governments, because this is the matter between two central banks, I mean, BOK and the Federal Reserve Bank. So let's see what happens. Right, we will then. Professor Bowen, we are currently facing a commodity crisis, a supply chain crisis, COVID-19 and war, like Professor Young mentioned, in Ukraine. Now, that being said, do you suppose the world is headed towards a grand recession? Well, uh, I think we all hope uh, that's not the case, uh, but it is clear that there's some warning signs that uh, uh, people should be cautious. Uh, I do think the uh, huge expansion in the economy is certainly over the last three years that we've experienced is, is unlikely to be sustained uh, in the near future. But uh, one must still be aware that uh, there's still drivers of growth. There's still a lot of productivity uh, in the United States in particular, uh, a lot of productivity in the tech sector. Uh, there's a lot of investment by the government. Uh, if somehow, you know, the U.S. government uh, passes uh, one of the acts um, related to semiconductors um, that does uh, imply quite a significant amount of government spending, which can drive GDP. Uh, so there are some drivers uh, of GDP growth in the United States. Uh, but yes, globally, uh, uh, things do look dire, particularly because of the war between uh, Ukraine um, and Russia, um, with that driving food supplies. And of course, everyone is going to be, every, all countries are going to be concerned about that. Uh, many countries are going to be affected by that because of food prices and of course, energy prices. And that feeds into prices of many other goods. Uh, so we are going to continue to see prices increasing uh, to the extent that governments can shore up supply and not give in too much to protectionist pressures. Um, that's what's going to moderate um, uh, the, um, uh, the, the slowdown that we're, we're expected to see. But yes, it is likely to slow down, but there are tools that governments can use to moderate that slowdown. Right, well, that is good to know then. All right, Professor Bowen, thank you very much for your time and your thoughts today. And Professor Yang here in the studio, thank you for your insights. Thank you. Thank you.